welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Bo Harstein, and I'm the Director of Research here at Select Sires. I'm excited to be hosting this new Q&A series brought to you by your farmer-owned cooperative, Select Sires. This series will cover a variety of topics where you'll learn about the latest genetic strategies from industry experts. The question and answer component offers you, our social media followers, an opportunity to ask your own questions to our experts. Each week before meeting with the experts, we'll ask our followers to submit questions via our social media channels. Then we'll take those questions to our experts and bring you their answers on Friday. Our first topic is longevity. Joining me for this discussion is Lyle Cruz, Select Sires is Vice President of US Market Development and Brian Kelroy, Team Leader and Regional Manager at Central Star Cooperative in Wisconsin. Lyle, Brian, thank you both for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Bo. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to be here to answer some longevity related question, uh, questions from our social media followers and customers. All right, let's get started. For question number one, I want to begin our discussion with some background information. To understand the value of longevity, we need to learn about how we got here. And so the question is, what management trends in the industry leading dairies today are driving dairy owners to increase their genetic selection for healthier, longer lived cows? Well, Bo, I'm going to start with that and just to lay a little background work. You know, probably two decades ago, dairies struggled to generate enough replacements to meet their needs. Uh, reproduction has greatly improved. A lot of herd management, uh, um, like housing and environment has greatly improved. And we've seen the advancement with genetics really promote uh, longevity. And so we need less heifers now today to keep the herds uh, heifer numbers together. And so we've seen a great reduction in replacement numbers. And, you know, with our profit max initiative, as well as, uh, you know, everybody basically focused on a strategic breeding approach today, we've seen quite a, de a decline in replacement inventories. So we've got basically a million less dairy replacements than we had a few years ago to, uh, you know, to use in the industry for future herd replacements. And we've seen quite a lot of beef semen used instead. And so that's been a big part of the development changes we've seen. So we've got fewer replacements and we can expect less horse culling in dairies today due, due to having fewer replacements. And so we believe that the commercial genetic focus will kind of shift towards making cows that last well past their second and third lactation and uh, you know lower turnover rates in the herd. And so, you know, we've been doing this at Select Sires in terms of our sire focus for some time now, but we continue to focus on traits like uh, mastitis, somatic cell, uh, the zoetis mastitis trait, the zoetis lameness trait. And frankly, uh, putting a lot of focus on dairy wellness profit dollars and herd health profit dollars. And so that's a big part of our current campaign is the campaign at Select Sires is to make longevity her legacy by placing genetic emphasis on profitable production increased fertility health traits and mastitis resistance and we really uh like you know in business a lot of businesses have used this quote but skate where the puck is going not where it's been uh, that's a famous wayne gretzky quote and we believe that we're going to be uh, skating to where the puck will be in the future with this initiative so as we look at the cost of re dairy replacements, one of the things that has to be factored in that basically it costs several thousand dollars to raise a heifer to uh, be a replacement in the herd. And they basically have to be well into their second lactation to pay for that cost, that rearing cost. And you know this graphic shows the different levels of milk production based on lactation numbers. So typically first lactation cows are gonna produce about 15% less than older cows do. And so a herd dominated by first lactation cows is gonna not have as much milk pounds shipped per day. If you look at the traditional calling of around 40%, that red line indicates what the herd demographic would look like 
And we believe as herds get calling levels closer to 25 to 30 percent, we're going to see a lot more third, fourth, fifth lactation cows in the herd and more of a traditional uh, approach with potential to ship five to seven pounds more milk. So as I, I do a lot of these genetic audits and herd uh, analysis with uh, key accounts and key members throughout the country, and uh, this is a couple examples of some reports, but at the top herd here, that's 43% of the milking cows as first lactation cows. And the bottom graphic, only 30% first lactation and 40% third and greater. So you can see the big difference here in the demographics. And this leads to about seven pounds more ship per day with the herd with the more mature uh, profile in their milking herd. Um, and this leads to potential for more challenges with, uh, you know, health issues. And so, Brian, I'll let you uh, kind of talk from your experiences. I know you've done a lot of this same analysis. Yes, and thanks, Lyle. And as we go through this, um, this slide, the one thing that usually happens in herds is when you look at the average somatic cell count, as the lactation groups increase, usually the average somatic cell count follows with that. So as we, we go on to the next slide and we look at reasons why cows leave the herd, it's, it's ever so important to make sure we keep that somatic cell count trending in a low direction as um, mastitis today is likely uh, in a lot of herds the number one reasons that animals are culled. And I think part of the reason kind of also follows maybe a management trend that happens in some dairies. Some of these cows aren't getting that two or second or third chance if they've had mastitis to really kind of come back. Mastitis is a, a costly um, problem on a dairy and it's often a reason that a cull is cull culled, right? So mm -hmm. when we look at trends today and why animals are being culled, mastitis is a very important and a high uh, priority for culling. And that's why it's ever so important we focus on, on high health traits, especially milk quality traits and genetics. And we look at the next slide, we have an impact of health events uh, for dairy cows. And um, as we look at that mastitis group, when you look over to the right, the culling risk there, 32.7%. So that means an average dairy, if an animal has mastitis one time, she has about a 33% chance of leaving the herd. And that's huge. And that's why that focus of making a healthy cow that lasts a long time and is profitable is key. That's really good information. And I think our viewers will really be perceptive to that. The next question that I have actually comes from a follower that is a producer. And they ask, I currently use net merit and TPI as my main genetic selection indexes. Why should I consider using or doing something else? Well, thanks, Bo. I, I guess, uh, you know, as we look at the index weightings, uh, you know, you certainly see good, you know, good genetic rank animals using any of these indexes. But typically, uh, TPI and net merit have the, the biggest share of selection use in the U.S., but currently weighting only 5% each for uh, mastitis and somatic cell. Uh, dairy wellness profit is a Zoetis index that has a 13% weighting. And Select Sires recently introduced herd health profit dollars, which is weighted at 19%. So we're going to get a lot more uh, aggressive selection for mastitis resistance with herd health profit dollars. If you continue to use net merit or TPI, we'd also advocate probably looking at uh, adding a side criteria for, let's say, uh, 2.7 or less for somatic cell, or uh, maybe one to two points plus for this, this uh, the CDCB mastitis index. Honing in on herd health profit dollars, how is this index different from all of the others you just mentioned? Yeah, you know, I talked about the weighting of uh, much heavier weighting and percentages for fitness and health. And also, uh, if you look at at the herd health profit dollar index, it's really a robust focus on fitness traits to help create profitable cows uh, that are built to last. Currently, it's exclusive to the Holstein breed, 
and data is available now on our public website and bull pages for every bull that's active in the industry, including all the select sire bulls, of course, but also other industry sires. That's a good explanation of herd health profit dollars. And I do want to remind everyone that you can find herd health profit dollar values on Select Sires' website. And we'll actually be hosting a Q&A to explore this new index in a few weeks' time. Moving on to some of our other questions, I'd like to shift focus to mastitis. So we know that mastitis costs U.S. dairy farmers an estimated $2 billion annually. We will be dedicating one of our Q&A segments to mastitis resistant genetics, but for today's talk, let's talk about management and economic benefits to lowering mastitis cases in the herd. And so my question is, what is the value of reducing somatic cell and mastitis incidence on my dairy? Well, for, first off, we have valid data to show all these, but the bottom line is increases in somatic cell counts and, of course, mastitis. Um, the result of, is typically from high cell counts is, is an offshoot of, of probably uh, an inflammatory condition in the mammary system. And uh, the bottom line is that we see a decrease in milk production, a decrease in reproduction. Of course, uh, it's difficult to keep cows in the herd if they have mastitis. It may even be difficult to ship milk in some regions of the country. And so to assure your milk supply, you've got a buyer for your milk, it's important that you put efforts to reduce this for sure. Uh, we see an increase in turnover rate and an increase in mortality in herds that have mastitis. And so, you know, the bottom line is you could argue over all kinds of data and you've seen some of the variances of different health events costs previously in a, in a slide a few slides ago, but uh, we went through a, a pretty ex extensive modeling with preventive veterinary medicine uh, issues here that shows that the in total uh, economic impact of mastitis is $444 and a lot of indirect costs and, and quite a few direct costs with that calculation. So we know reproduction is significantly impacted. You can go into, like say dairy comp and do a bread sum and compare a group of cows that are under versus over 300,000. You'll see as much as a 10% difference in pregnancy rate. So as we look at some of these uh, these data analysis, uh, Brian does a lot of these and Brian, I'll, uh, I'll just let you kind of work your way through these and explain these a little bit. Sounds good, thanks again, Lyle. And what we're looking at here are two different groups of cows, a first lactation cow group and a second lactation cow group. And these animals are genomic tested. And what we're looking at is their genomic data for their somatic cell score, or SCS. And as we go through, it's important to know and remember when we talk about somatic cell score, a lower number is more um, beneficial. That's the number we're striving for. So when we look in the quartiles here on the genetic audit, in the group that's labeled the lowest group that averages 2.74 for there's 567 cows in that group. So of those 567 cows, they average 2.74 for their genomic somatic cell score. Their average somatic cell count is 125,000. So it's as we go into the second quartile, that group averages 2.87 of those 569 cows for an average somatic cell count of 148,000. As we move down the third quartile, 2.96 average of those 583 cows for an average somatic cell count of that group of 230. And I think really Lyle and Bull, where it jumps out to me is that highest group, right? When we look at that highest group of cows, there's 630 cows in that group. They average 3.09 for their genomic somatic cell score, and their average somatic cell count in that group is 381,000. That's a drastic difference. You know, if my math is correct, it's about 256, 250,000 different somatic cell count just between that low and the high group. And we look over to the right-hand side, Lyle had just talked about the total cost being about $444 per cow. There's a big significant cost difference to the dairy producer between the best cows for somatic cell score and the lowest. And when we look at the second lactation cows, we see a very similar trend again, correct? We look at that 
lowest group. There's 382 animals in that group. They average 2.80 for their genomic somatic cell score. And they, again, average 125,000 for their average somatic cell count. Moving down to the bottom, that next group at 2.92 for somatic cell score, they're averaging 149,000 for somatic cell count. Moving down to the third group, and then again, when we go down to the fourth group, there's, that group averages 3.14 of those 420 animals, 294,000 somatic cell count in that group. So again, a huge difference between the top and the bottom. And again, on the right-hand side, a big cost difference to the producer in that. So what we see here is putting extra focus on somatic cell score definitely results in a lower somatic cell count for the dairy producer. And as Lyle said, those cows in that top group are just healthier than those cows in the lowest group. Yeah, and, and uh, a few years ago, CCB came out with a new mastitis trait, which is considered to be fairly low on heritability, Brian. But, uh, you know, when you look at this data, I'm sure you were pretty astounded what you found here as well. Yes, absolutely, Lyle. And I think what this data says is there is absolutely reason and benefit to put emphasis on the CDCB mastitis trait. When we look at, again, we're looking at genomic tested animals. We're going to look at first and second lactation cow groups. So we'll start with the first lactation cows up on top. So in that group, so here, just to kind of step back, a higher number is better. So we want a higher number for CDCB mastitis. That is more beneficial. So when we look at the quartiles, the lowest group in the genomic tested animals, there's 562 in that quartile average minus 0.8 for genomic mastitis. You look at their average somatic cell count, 311. As we move down those first lactation animals, that second quartile, they were positive at 0.5 for their average genomic mastitis trait. There are 560 cows in that group, had a 247,000 uh, average somatic cell count. The third group at plus 1.5, that group averaged 195,000 for their somatic cell count. So again, we're making nice progress here. Then we see an even bigger jump in the highest quartile, that group of 618 cows with an average of 2.4 on their genomic CDCB mastitis trait, resulting in an average somatic cell count of 152. But I think where it really kind of port protrudes in the mastitis events, right? So we know it's following the, the somatic cell count, but when we're focusing on CDC mastitis, we also re we really wanna look at those events. So when we look at the events from the, from the quartiles, the lowest group, 135, the second group, 76, the third group, there are 61 events, and then the last group, 44. So when you think about percentages in that group, 24% of the first citation animals in that lowest group had a mastitis event, and only 7% of the highest group had a mastitis event. That's huge. That's, that's time, that's labor, that's less uh, milk loss for treatment. You know, and, and when you go through this, I, less animals that got culled, right? We know that a third of animals that get mastitis get culled approximately. So a big difference there. And as you see at the total cost at $444 a cow, again, there's about a $40,000 difference between the lowest group and the highest group. When we look at the second lactation cows, you know, I think this one's uh, very interesting. Again, um, the lowest group at minus 1.4, those 399 cows had 182 mastitis events. There's 399 cows in that group. That means over 45% of the cows in that lowest group got mastitis. That's a huge number, right? 45%. But as we go down the quartiles, the animals that had a better genomic mastitis CDCB score had less mastitis events. The second quartile, those averaged zero. They only had 156 events. The third quartile at plus 0.8. Those 381 animals had 112 events. And then the highest group or the best group of second lactation cows that averaged 2.0, they only had 92 events. So again, we see a, you know, a double, right? We had twice as many cows in that lowest group get mastitis as in the highest group. So again, as Lyle mentioned, a low heritability trait, but when you look at these two groups, again, there's about a $40,000 difference to the producer in the high to low groups which leads me, you know, even though it's a low heritability trait, 
there's definitely a lot of reason and a lot of evidence to put emphasis on it in your genetic selection. Really good information. And I mean, everyone knows that those mastitis cases are chipping away at your profit margins, but to really see it in an economic dollar value is pretty alarming. So I think our, our customer owners will appreciate that information. And so to wrap up this Q&A session, um, I have a general but important final question. What can dairy owners do to keep cows in the herd longer? And uh, before Lyle jumps in here, I'll just uh, start this out by saying, I'd say one of the most important things would be to use the best genetics you can afford on the best females in your herd to make that next generation. And um, to really increase you know, your breeding strategy and genetic intensity and selection. And select sires can always help um, help you with that to try to pick your best females to, to mate them to the best bulls for the, for the traits you really focus on and going after. I wholeheartedly agree. Lyle? Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, we talked already about maybe enhancing your selection uh, from a genetic standpoint to include more focus on somatic cell and mastitis and the zoetis mastitis trait. Those are all good genetic indicators to reduce mastitis prevalence in your herd, improve mastitis in the herd, or re resistance to mastitis. I would also say, you know, you just using indexes like dairy wellness profit or herd health profit dollars can also be a good way to go at it. Um, they both have a robust uh, focus for daughter pregnancy rate. And so what we like about, of course, herd health profit dollars, it's available across all industry bulls and it even has more weighting for mastitis resistance. Also, Select Sires recently came out with an in, uh, a new designation for sires in our Holstein and Jersey lineups with this mastitis resistant pro designation. So bulls with that green uh, symbol you see there are going to be uh, superior for mastitis resistance in all three of those indexes, somatic cell, zoetis mastitis, as well as the CECB mastitis trait. So a lot of opportunity there from a genetic standpoint. And, uh, you know, really what we're trying to do is genetically create cows that age well. And we want these third, fourth, fifth lactation cows that get in the herd, uh, produce high quality, um, high quality, high volume milk. Also, um, you know, get pregnant. And so, you know, we've heard it referred to as four, four event cows. We're looking for cows that calve, uh, get pregnant go dry and do it very efficiently in the herd. <clears throat> as far as technology goes, we also offer dairy producers the opportunity to uh, uh, invest in the cow manager monitoring system. And that system has really been enhanced over the last 10 years. And it currently includes uh, not only uh, health alerts to help you react sooner to cows that have issues, but also the nutrition modules uh, been greatly enhanced and with machine learning it actually has proactive indications of cows that early in their uh, pre-fresh stage we can get in front of potential transition issues that would have normally uh, required an alert to identify after calving. So we've got both preactive and reactive treatments available with that technology. So there are several things there Bo to talk about and a lot more meat on the bone to go over on that for sure. Definitely. And so with that, those were great responses related to our questions surrounding longevity. Brian, Lyle, thank you both so much for your insights and we appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And so for our viewers, thank you all for joining today's longevity question and answer session. Stay tuned as we announce future Q&A topics and be sure to send us your questions. We'll talk to you all again soon.